All right, good afternoon. Ooh, that's loud. Is that as loud back there as it is here? <laughs> um, welcome, everybody, and thank you for coming. I think it um, sounds like the coffee break was a bit short, so we might still have some people drifting in. Um, I'm Janine Ramtula. I'm um, an, assist an associate professor at the University of British Columbia in Canada, and this is Gabriela Baragan, who is a PhD student working in my team. Um, and we are delighted to be here today as the chairs of the session, which is Forest Restoration in Complex Landscapes. Um, and we are set up today to have uh, four, four full talks and then two of these crazy flash talks. Um, one of the flash talks hasn't shown up, so it might just be one. So we should have plenty of time for questions. Um, and so after each talk, we'll have a chance for people to ask questions. I would invite you, if you're going to ask a question, to just introduce yourself first so we can get to know people. Um, and then at the end, we should have a solid 10 or 15 minutes for some other questions. And I think at that point, I'll ask all of the people that have spoken to come to the front um, so that we can have hopefully some broader synthetic questions as well, um, although specific questions to talks are fine as well. So um, with that, we will go ahead and get started. And we're going to start with Gabriela first, who's going to speak on um, planted to die, viability of tree species in active restoration plots under climate change. <laughs> no, no, yeah, now it makes sense. Thanks. So active restoration relies on tree planting to mitigate climate change effects by means of um, carbon sequestration. And this awareness of the climate change effects has triggered massive restoration initiatives globally. Um, well, uh, one of these huge and massive initiatives is the Vaughan Challenge, which pledged to restore 350 million hectares by 2030. So to date, 58 countries committed to restore an equivalent of 49% of the total pledge. 61% is still remaining. So the major indicator of uh, this goal achievement is the number of hectares planted. But trees are long living species. So to ensure that we will uh, reach uh, restoration goals and overall commitments, we'll need to ensure that these trees will persist for the long term. And climate change could be this external factor which could influence this persistence, um, adding a stress to um, the species, uh, tree species planted, or even uh, threatening their survival in the future. And these frameworks, um, these frameworks has included um, climate change projections um, to allocate these areas for restoration or for selecting species. And so paradoxically, we are uh, restoring for mitigating climate change, but climate change itself could threaten this uh, survival and the ability of these species in these restoration plots. So what we usually do is we select these hard boundary static restoration plots, and we may select these species uh, which have uh, suitable climatic conditions inside these plots, right? And this set of suitable uh, climatic conditions are the climate envelopes. And so, under potential future climatic conditions, um, these climate envelopes could especially shift, partially or completely. So this species, um, for tree species, will be virtually impossible to, to disperse and track these future climatic conditions, right? And so this special misfits between um, future climate envelopes and restoration plots could threaten the viability of these tree species in the future. So we ask this question, right? Will tree species currently being planted in restoration plots be viable under future climate change projections? And so we here address viability as this probability of the species presence through time. So these climate embols will, uh, be, um, will be persistent. And in our alternative hypothesis, we show that, uh, we will show that this um, viability will get reduced because of these special shifts in climate envelopes or suitable climatic conditions. So we use the database of 1,240 uh, restoration plots of a project conducted in Northwest Ecuador between 2014 and 2015. Um, well, here is Ecuador, here in the coast of the country. And we selected eight native species to the country which represented the 85% of the total number of plants used for this project. 
and two native, two were native uh, to this, uh, two, two were native to this specific area, and six were non-native, uh, but native to the Amazon, which is here. Um, so we also use the database of georeference occurrence records, which represent the distribution of these species, the natural distribution. And we model the probability of presence of these species based on niche modeling analysis. So we use, uh, we model baseline, um, we, we model this under baseline climatic conditions and under future potential climatic conditions. We use this base occurrence records uh, and these uh, baseline climatic conditions are predictive variables. And uh, for future climatic conditions, we, we used 18 general circulation models and two concentration scenarios, the RCP 4.5 of medium intensity and 8.5 of higher intensity. And to the years, um, to oops, sorry, oh, okay. Um, to the years 2030, 2050, 2070, and here this, we are showing up these maps. And warmer colors, we see higher probability of presence, whereas in lower color, in cooler color, we see um, a lower probability of, of, of presence. So for our data analysis, we extracted this probability of presence of this species per restoration plot. We calculated the proportion of plots containing um, each species. So we divided the number of plots, uh, the remnant of number of plots containing the species under future climatic conditions by the number of plots where the species were initially planted, which were our baseline climatic conditions. So uh, what we can see here is the proportion of plots containing the species through time, right? Under a scenario RCP uh, 4.5. And here in these different colors, we see our species. The average mean loss for this scenario um, was 32% of plots. So in this example, for example, uh, this example, for example, uh, this uh, light blue, uh, this species in light blue, we'll see that this species will lose more than the 25% of the plots where these species were initially planted. And the highest average loss of plots uh, that we show um, were in, under, uh, in the year 2030. When we compare this uh, RCP 4.5 with uh, RCP 8.5, we see that the average mean loss for 8.5 is 75% percent of plots that will be lost um, into, uh, under this uh, scenario. And again, um, uh, the year 2030 is the year where we will be experiencing the highest um, loss of plots. So the cumulative percentage of uh, plots by the year 2070 is uh, under RCP 4.5, it's 33%, and RCP 8.5, it is 75% of plots uh, that will be lost, as we can see here. But, and this will be rela closely related with the hypothesis we, um, that we established at the very beginning, that the number of initial plots containing the species will decrease through time, showing overall non viability. But of course, this vary among the species. So, in this case, what we saw for a native species study study area that showed higher potential to persist through time. And here our study area is this um, black um, square is inside. Um, and for our non-native species, which were originally um, distributed, which are originally distributed in the Amazon, we'll see that um, this species will decrease, uh, persistence will decrease through time. How, yeah. So, we are facing these um, unprecedented climate change effects, and we are projected to have this, again, unprecedented climate change um, uh, yeah, uh, effects in the future. But also we are facing and tackling this, um, conducting this, again, unprecedented uh, massive initial, rest uh, massive uh, restoration programs. And so, oops, most so uh, one example of that, yeah, is the bond challenge. But uh, most recently, the United Nations environment declared this as the decade of ecosystem restoration, the year 2021 to 2030. And what we saw in our results is that the highest average loss of plots will, be, will occur in the year 2030. 32% um, of, of plots uh, will be lost in uh, RCP 4.5 and 75% RCP 8.5. So we'll need to start thinking about including climate change um, in planning restoration, and this could lead to long-term restoration success. So 
some strategies that could help to incorporate climate change in, in, in planning research and could be species on site selection, also a, a conductive adaptive management strategies based on a scenario, a scenario building, setting uh, thresholds, and also management based on knowledge building and a transfer of technology. So we're planted to die, of course not, we, uh, but indeed we're planted to survive and we need to um, think that we're, we are planning the forests of that we will have in the future, but thinking ahead in the climates that we will want to have in the future. And thank you so much. This uh, re in research was conducted thanks to the Rosalie Train Education for Nature, uh, University of British Columbia Faculty of Forestry, Landscape and Livelihoods Lab, and thanks to all the people who contributed with valuable comments. Thank you so much. Okay. <laughs> Well, yeah, um, well, the first question, yeah, for this, uh, in this research, we didn't address the, we didn't address um, the, well, the, we didn't address, um, yeah, yeah, we didn't address the adaptations that the species could have, and it, that will be related with uh, the genetic, uh, the, so the that, adaptation and plasticity. Yeah, well, we based on the distribution of the natural distribution of the species. So we model where the species will be uh, will, will will be distributed based on their uh, herbarium data <laughs> under based by climatic conditions, and then uh, based on that projected where the species will uh, where the, the species will distribute. They will most probably where it will be most probable to to distribute in the future, and then we address that shift um, in the probability of that presence between, but we didn't go into the biological traits of each species to, you know, I don't know, we didn't address the, the, the genetic plasticity of the species, so what will be this uh, physiological um, in the, these uh, temperature, uh, let's say boundaries that the, the species could uh, address under, under climate change. So, yeah, this, this uh, research was mostly to um, call the attention that we'll need to ha have a look, take a look on climate change. But um, yeah, we didn't go that into the biological traits. But thank you so much for, for that insight. Maybe the second question can be please. Yeah, and again, yeah, we didn't take like data mi of uh, microclimate to address this was um, yeah, modeling, based on modeling, basically. Yeah, yeah, I do. Yeah, I think that one important thing is that we have this, uh, rep this representative concentration pathways and themselves they offer us various scenarios, right? And so as I mentioned, um, like adaptive management could be one strategy. So we, we plan, we uh, implement the projects, we evaluate the projects, and then at the same time we monitor what will be the the trends and the, 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 for example, the concentration trends, and then we can readjust um, our management um, goals, uh, and, and even we can set new new goals for for that. And um, um, yeah, I think that that would be one one key aspect to consider for this.
Well, yeah, yeah. Well, not necessarily die, but at least we could potentially face this um, stress, and um, in the in the future. But yeah, in, again, we will, will need to learn more about the the, adapt, the ad biological and adaptations of the species themselves to to the climate change. But yeah, um, thanks. <laughs> And we're an endangered species. And that is also something really interesting that um, just thinking about one approach, for example, the one of, this is a forest landscape restoration, but the approach of the ecological re uh, restoration where they select these uh, reference ecosystems and then based on those, um, they select native species and try to use those for, for restoration that could also help to, um, to, to, yeah, to actually select the species that um, that could also have a genetic memory of, uh, of the biophysical conditions um, where the species evolved and, and could persist also through time. But again, climate change is, um, but climate change could add this stress on and, and species. Um, yep. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Orange? Yes. I think that that's off now, right? Excellent. All right. Well, I'm going to talk a little bit more about species. Um, my title is Restoring Forests for Whom? Aligning Local Livelihood Needs with Ecological Criteria for Successful Forest Landscape Restoration in Malawi. Oops. All right, so Gabrielle has already started discussing this, and I think most of you will know that there has been um, a lot of different calls over the last decade for widespread forest restoration, right? So we've seen the Bond Challenge, we've seen the New York Declaration, that's the UN Decade on Ecosystem Restoration, there are initiatives in Africa and Latin America, they're all over the place, right? So they're huge. These are really ambitious, um, really ambitious commitments. It's really exciting to think about the scale of what it is that people around the world are committing to um, and, and thinking about as being feasible, right? It's this huge opportunity. It's also really interesting to think about how we're actually going to do this, right? So how do we implement these really, really large commitments on the ground in complex landscapes? So we got complex landscapes already, especially in the global south where there are a lot of people that are already living on the landscape. There are multiple and competing demands on what the land ought to offer. And now on top of it, we're going to throw in these really ambitious restoration schemes, right? We're going to restore all of this stuff. Well, how is that all going to work? So to put some of this in perspective, um, the, the bond challenge targets are super ambitious, right? They're promising, if we get the commitments, um, of a total of about 2 to 3% of the ice-free land on the surface of the globe. So that's huge. It's, it's about the same, depending on the estimates, about the same of the, um, of the urban land area on the planet. The legacies of these plantings are going to persist for thousands of years, right? So we got some really interesting work that shows, for example, in Europe, we can look at forests in Europe and still see the imprint of agriculture, of Roman agriculture, 2,000 years ago. So whatever it is that we're planting now, this is what people are going to be living with the ramifications of that for thousands of years. So it's an opportunity, but also something we need to be thinking about. What's this going to be looking like in the future? And we know we've seen some awesome talks already at the conference about the various trade-offs that we see. So when we're designing multifunctional landscapes, it's not always possible to get everything. There really are a lot of trade-offs between different objectives. And there was a really neat study done um, in Australia a few years ago where they examined if we were to plan restoration um, with carbon, carbon as mitigation is the main goal, versus if we did it for biodiversity, how different would those planning schemes look? And it turns out that they look completely different. So if you're planning for carbon or if you're planning for biodiversity, you get a different outcome in terms of what you should restore and where to do it. So it really lays an awful lot of different questions about, you know, what, what are we going to plant, especially in terms of species, and Gabriella's work speaks to that as well. Uh, where are we going to plant it, and who decides, right? So what are the values, and, and how are we going to figure out, you know, which of these competing demands we're going to meet? 
So we started a project, uh, me and a group of students, in Malawi a couple years ago. Um, so Malawi, obviously in, in Africa. Um, interesting, it's one of the lowest income countries on the planet, facing really huge socioeconomic challenges. So really large population growth, a very high rate of HIV prevalence. Uh, most people don't have electricity. Everybody uses fuel wood, mostly fuel wood, sometimes charcoal um, as their main energy source. The deforestation rate is between 1% to 3%, depending on the estimates that you see. And Casey Ryan, who's in here somewhere, gave a great talk yesterday talking about that even with deforestation apart from that, in the forests that aren't actively being deforested, um, we're seeing really large drops in biomass within those forests. So deforestation, change in forest systems beyond that. Um, from the ecological perspective, so just again to put this into perspective, um, Malawi Falls, do I have a pointer here, here we go, right in here. So the, the, the um, vegetation that has been here historically, it's part of the Miyamba woodland, which is a dry savanna type. Um, so when we think again about what we're gonna plant, right, thinking a little bit about this is what's been there for a really long time, what people are used to and what ecosystems are adapted to. So as we think particularly about species, thinking a little bit about how that fits in with what's already there. Uh, Malawi has made some really ambitious restoration targets, and so they keep ratcheting it up every year, and the most recent, um, their bond commitment is 4.5 million hectares, which is 50% of their land base. So it's huge. Um, they've put together a really nice planning document uh, as part of, for those of you that know, it's a, a Rome methodology that they use for this to basically put forward if they're, gonna, if they're gonna look at restoration and figure out where to prioritize it across the country. Um, they've thought about what the goals for that are and how they're gonna do that. And it's really interesting when you look at those restoration goals, so they are to increase agricultural productivity, enhance community resilience to climate change, address water scarcity, and enhance the availability and sustainability of biomass energy. So those are all really awesome goals. Um, what strikes me when I look at it is that it's really interesting that, that restoring biodiversity or restoring ecosystem function isn't there as an explicit goal. So obviously that underpins a lot of what's here, but they're not looking at it in terms of perhaps an, uh, a restoration ecologist might where we're looking at restoring ecosystems um, back to having some kind of an integrity, ecological integrity. So again, really interesting just to think about kind of the, the dynamics of what that might look like. So when we started in Malawi, we were really interested in trying to understand um, what it was, how it was that local people were making use of forest resources, what it is that they wanted out of their forest resources. Um, and then there has been a lot of, um, of restoration that's happened already. So we were really curious to go and talk to the people that were doing restoration to figure out, well, what are they restoring and how well does that meet with whatever the local preferences are. So I'm, gonna, I'm just gonna show just a small part of some of the data we've, we've collected. Um, I'm gonna start by characterizing current forest use and I'm gonna focus on fuel wood because that's the main use that people make of forests. So I'm gonna take a look at uh, how much fuel wood people are using, where they're getting it, um, and then the species. So what species do they tend to use? We asked a bunch of questions around what species people would prefer to use. Um, and then we went out and characterized a lot of the current reforestation practices to figure out, well, who's planting, what are they planting, um, and, and how does that compare with what it was that people told us that they're using and that they're interested in using. So there's um, Malawi, our study areas here in the Zamba district in the south, and you can see a little bit about what it looks like here. So these black dots are villages that we sampled, and so there's kind of, this is kind of a flat land area here, which is agricultural, and then these forest reserves, they go, they go up the mountain. And so as you climb up the mountain, you get forest. Um, they're zoned as forest reserves, but areas where people are permitted to go and make use of forest resources. Uh, not going to talk a lot about the methods, but basically we did a, a bunch of different things. We did a whole pile of household surveys to talk to people about how they were using different forest resources. We did some focus groups to understand what the barriers and challenges to reforestation success are. Uh, we did a whole pile of forest plots to understand what the species composition and structure of these different kinds of forests and restoration plots look like. Um, and then we surveyed um, many of the major actors who were involved in restoration to find out who's planting, what are they planting, and what are their goals. All right, so just a few results. So first of all, how much fuel wood are households using? Um, so you can see here, there's just a box, a box plot. So daily fuel wood usage is on average about five kilograms per household. And it takes a lot of time for people to collect that, that fuel wood. So on average, again, this is per week, so about five hours per week in collection time. The burden of that work falls predominantly on women, so it's women and it's girl children in the, in the family, in the household that are doing most of that collecting. So it's a lot of wood, a lot of wood that needs to be collected, and a lot of time that it takes to actually be collecting that. 
Where did they collect it? Well, they collect fuel wood in two different places and in, um, ab about evenly, just depending on the distribution. So they collect it, first of all, in the homestead. So in the homestead, it's right around the houses where they live. There's a lot of trees that are planted. Those tend to be a lot of mango trees and eucalyptus. And so people will collect right around their households. They will also go up into the forest reserves to collect, uh, to collect fuel wood as well. Which is interesting because the forest reserves are really quite far away, right? So a homestead, this is looking at the walking distance. A homestead, you don't have to walk anywhere because you're already in your homestead. You can collect whatever's there. But to get up into the forest reserve, just depending on how high up the mountain you're going to go and where you live, can take a significant period of time. So this is two to 300 minutes in walking distance that people are actually going um, there and back in order to be able to collect their wood. So why would you go to the forest reserve if you're actually able to get most of what you need around a homestead? We could take a look a little bit at the species that are there, and you'll see that the species vary a lot depending on where people go. So in orange, first of all, we have the homestead, what it is that people are collecting, and in green, it's the forest reserve. So if we look first at the homestead, people are collecting a lot of eucalyptus, which is a, an exotic or non-native species, a handful of other exotic species, and a lot of exotic fruit, so mango. Mango's been there for a long time, but we've labeled it exotic, so it's mostly mango and eucalyptus. There's a few indigenous species and indigenous fruit species that are there, um, but the forest reserve, people are going there predominantly to be, to be, um, to be collecting indigenous species of trees. So again, Miambo woodland, it's uh, a, a handful of species, um, that I can talk about if you care, but that uh, basically people are collecting and then indigenous fruit species. When we asked people what it is that they are currently using predominantly for fuel wood versus what they would prefer to use, so we see again a, a similar difference, right? So what are they currently using? They're using a lot of eucalyptus um, and they're using a bunch of indigenous species as well. When we asked what they prefer to use, we were actually quite surprised to see that there is a really large preference for the indigenous species that are there. And that comes down a lot when we talk to people a little bit about the, um, the heat properties and the burning properties when you're trying to cook over these fuels. They, 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 they cook differently. Um, it's, it's partly a cultural preference, partly about the way that things cook, partly um, about people's, um, um, people's preference for cooking for, with different species. And so there's a real interest there in using the indigenous species. Um, and then we also, we also talked to a lot of the different people that are doing restoration, reforestation projects on the landscape. And so there are three major players in terms of reforestation. There are local communities. Um, so these tend to be the local community village resource management boards um, that are managing the forest reserves. There are NGOs, both local NGOs and international NGOs, and then there are private estates. So a lot of these are just planting species sp specifically for themselves, a lot of tobacco. So they'll be using it for drying tobacco. We look at the number of trees we asked, the number of trees that were planted over the last 10 years, and you can see that the bulk of them are being planted by the NGOs, right? So we're talking about 150 million trees here. Local villages are planting 3 million, which is great, but kind of, kind of dwarfed by the amount that the NGOs, and most of the NGOs that are planting that number are the international NGOs. We take a look at what people are planting. So local communities are planting a mix of indigenous and exotic. Uh, as are the local NGOs, but really interestingly, the international NGOs are still planting mostly exotic and mostly eucalyptus species. Private estates are planting mostly exotic, but mostly primarily for their own use. So this is really interesting to see that there seems to be quite, um, quite a mismatch in terms of what it is that people seem to be wanting and what might make more sense in some ways from an ecological perspective versus what appears to be planting, being planted in large amounts on the landscape. So I think there's potential um, for better reforestation to be undertaken here, certainly in terms of the species choices that we're making. So it's a potential for higher use of native species to meet both livelihood and ecological goals. Um, people don't plant the indigenous species because they grow really slowly and it's hard to find the seed stock, hard to find them in nurseries. Um, but certainly I think there's ways that we could be trying to Im improve that or do more of it. Local communities and local NGOs are already doing a really great job of using many native species and taking an integrated approach. And so I think maybe um, we need to be learning a little bit more from that or empowering them to be um, doing more of the local reforestation projects. And finally, just a thank you to all, especially all of the villagers who spent a lot of time answering our tedious questions and a lot of uh, local field assistance as well. Thank you. <laughs> Do we have time for questions? Yeah, okay, if there are any questions. Yeah, Shard. Uh, just a curious question. I was wondering, say I misunderstood your research. Is yep. it like you're saying that showing that people actually prefer the native species without yep. getting the whole where you're getting the resources that they actually prefer? Mm -hmm. So in this case, there is no harm in the idea of goals and... 
Yeah, so except for the fact that the, the most of the trees that are being planted are being planted by the international NGOs and it's mostly eucalyptus. And so we could be doing a lot better, like the local NGOs I think are doing and local village uh, natural resource management councils are doing a really good job of planting a mix that I think local people want, but most of the trees that are getting planted here are being funded by the international NGOs. And so if they're planting mostly eucalyptus, then they are not doing a very good job of meeting local needs. Nor, nor ecological needs, that's right. So yes, I, that, I guess that's essentially what I'm saying is that I think we have a lot of room here to be doing a better job of combining these. And I think maybe there are some assumptions out there that from a social perspective, we want to plant eucalyptus uh, because it grows fast, et cetera, et cetera. And yet I think there's a real appetite for... It's crazy, right? Like I can't believe it in some ways that it was still, we were quite surprised by that. Yeah, Casey. Maybe there's something you're not, not quite believe it. Yeah. Yeah, which is not what I'm trying to say, yeah. Um, and as I understood it, the eucalyptus planting program has been raised since the 90s to about the question of forest space. Mm. Because forest and trails are not designed to get them removed or taken care of. And we know most people work so slowly that they yep. just don't bother providing staff for them. Yeah. Yeah. And they, they put the eucalyptus around the edges of the reserve yep. so that they didn't have to walk so far and so yep. they didn't use the reserve. Yeah. 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 And, and of course, I'm not an advocate for, for planting eucalyptus, but yeah. there, there's a broader discussion about why they were putting those in. Yeah. So it wasn't necessarily about trying to optimize yeah. the restoration in the area around the reserve. It was trying to protect the reserve. Yeah. But it's not working, right? And so it's you can you can see it. So people will go like you're exactly right that they're around the edges. People will go and collect the eucalyptus, but then they go beyond that, right? And they're going specifically up higher to get other things, and so. Yeah, so I think you're right. I mean, I think you're right that there's good reasons for them to be planted. Um, but in the reserves where we were working anyway, so they had all the local villages had management plans that allowed people to go. And perhaps reflection, right, that people want to be, want to be accessing these species. Absolutely. I think yep. the assumption is that the resource is too small. For yep. Them. Yes. So, and there's no way out of that. Yes. And the eucalypts are, are one attempt to resolve that. Yep. Yeah, so I guess the question becomes what's a different way to resolve that tension that's actually going, going to work? And like you showed yesterday with the, with the reductions in biomass, right? So it's not working because we're still seeing, you know, a, a, a loss of the biomass in those forests. And so, yeah. Another question here? Yeah. Um, I was wondering if they collect other stuff than wood, maybe, which might be the reason why they go so far away, maybe tools or hunt or do some other activity. Yeah, yeah, so we, we looked a little bit at that as well, and they are collecting other things as they go as well. In terms of the sheer mass of what they're collecting, the fuel wood is the most important thing. Yeah, but yes, they are collecting other things as they go out there along the way. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Is it working? Yeah. No? Oh, okay. Thank you. <laughs> so um, I'm uh, Sophie Plassin. I'm a postdoctoral research associate at the University of Oklahoma in the United States. Uh, but today I will present a research project I collaborated when I was a PhD student uh, with CIRAD, which is a French institution in Brazil. Um, so this research project is actually more a research action project that involves several institutions in Brazil, also French institutions and um, international institutions such as WWF. Um, so our starting point in this project is that the landscape in, uh, along the arc of deforestation in Amazon as a result of a systematic deforestation uh, use of fire and extractive management. Um, and um, in this context, uh, people tend to um, um, apply those strategies because land appropriation was a priority over land production, but also over uh, sustainable management of uh, natural resources. 
uh, this extract extractive management has led to large area of degraded pasture, but also large area of uh, degraded forest and uh, fragmentation of remaining patches, patches of forest. Uh, since 2005 in Brazil, several public and private, um, private initiatives um, have been able to slow down deforestation, um, but they didn't go beyond the goal of zero deforestation. So in this project, we want to address this question, how can we better support a transition toward more uh, sustainable production systems? Um, <clears throat> and so to, um, to address this question, we rely on the concept of land suitability. Uh, so why? Uh, the current landscape in Amazon, are, um, actually there are a lot of many agricultural areas that are, um, and cattle ranching activity that are located in a vulnerable area where there is a low agricultural potential. On the other hand, there are a lot of many uh, degraded forests, but also fragmented and fire-prone forests that are located in areas with high potential for agriculture. And so as a result, um, economic performances are not optimized and there is a low provision of ecosystemic ser of ecosystem services uh, such as carbon sequestration or uh, soil protection, biodiversity and water cycle. Um, <clears throat> so to move forward um, sustainable uh, landscape, uh, land suitability becomes a key uh, to reorganize those landscapes. Um, and so uh, we address that uh, this way. So new farming systems are designed uh, where agricultural uh, activities are located in areas with a high um, potential for agriculture, so with the best soil and with the best uh, topographic units. And at the same time, uh, forests are restored in those areas that are more vulnerable but that have a very uh, important role for uh, connectivity, so for biodiversity, but also for water cycle and uh, soil protection and then so on. And this way we can improve both economic performances but also uh, provision of ecosystem services. Um, so to implement this concept, uh, we propose to develop a landscape restoration plan in a jurisdictional governance approach, so which is defined by both and all by a government-led comprehensive approach to forest and land use across one or more legally defined uh, territories. And we apply this plan in the, um, a case study, Paragominas, um, so Paragominas is located along the arc of deforestation. Um, it, uh, it is very famous in this area because it has been the first green municipality that committed to not deforest uh, beyond 50% of the area. Uh, so this is an overview of the landscape restoration plan. Uh, so we start by mapping both land suitability and land use and um, essentially forest degradation. Then we identify priority area for forest restoration, but also agricultural and cattle intensification. Then we propose a municipal microzoning. Um, and then farmers can implement an individual plan in their farm. And finally, we monitor the land use change as well as ecological uh, indicator assessment. So I will go over the different box. Um, so for the mapping of land suitability, uh, we use different type of data, so topographic unit, but also data about soil, declivity and hydrographic networks uh, that we also combine with interviews with farmers about their strategy in terms of practices and also where they prefer locate those practices. And we end up with a map of land suitability with five classes. Uh, so here is a picture of the landscape. Uh, I don't know if I have time. Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay. So um, we have five, cl five classes uh, with different um, performances, both for agriculture or for ecosystem services. We have the plateau and the glaciers uh, that are more ad uh, appropriate for agricultural production. The ravine, the slope, and depressional area are more... Um, um, adequate for ecosystem services pro provision. 
Uh, then we map the land uses and the forest degradation. Uh, so for uh, land use, we uh, use so uh, recent um, image, uh, satellite imagery from 2005, and we mainly want to uh, separate open area and forest. But what we are more interested, this is the forest degradation, so uh, the different level um, of degradation in the forest. So from high, medium to low. Then we cross those two maps of land suitability and, um, and land uses uh, to identify priority areas. Uh, so here are the different, um, um, are the five classes I've presented for the land suitability with uh, the different purpose, so all for economic production or for ec ecosystem services uh, provision. And so we cross with the land use um, and then we uh, define, uh, we recommend potential land uses. So for example, uh, if the land use is uh, a preserved forest in any unit of the land suitability map, we recommend to keep in forest. If the land use in 2017 uh, was a degraded forest, uh, then it depends of the pedomorphological unit. So if it's a plateau or glacier rise, which is uh, more suitable for economic production, uh, then it has to be defined. Or it will be a forest restoration, or it can be open for agricultural production. But if um, this is a ravine, a slope, or a depressional area, which have an important role for uh, connectivity um, and soil protection, then uh, we recommend to restore. And for the other land uses that are not in forest, uh, again, it depends. If it's a plateau or glacis, we recommend to keep in production. If it's located in a ravine slope or depression, depressional area, we recommend to reforest. So here is a map uh, with the different uh, potential uses class. So keep protected, intensify, restore, to be defined or reforest. And uh, what we did was to um, assess uh, for the municipality of Paragominas uh, the difference, um, uh, so for each uh, pedomorphological unit, so the total area. And so then um, for each type of land use, uh, so the area in this uh, pedomorphological unit. And then we were able to um, um, assess um, like the area that should be intensified for agricultural production, uh, area that should be better used for a strategic reforestation, area that should be uh, keep protected, area that should be restored, and area that should be, um, that could be open uh, for a strategic, uh, an improvement of um, agricultural production. And so um, that way we have a landscape reorganization uh, that aim to create um, a more connected forest matrix, but also improve the economic production. Then uh, this cartography uh, can be voted um, so as a municipal law uh, and discussed uh, in the municipal congress. Um, and after it has been approved, um, the goal will be to implement in the farm, so at an individual level. Um, and so uh, why? Because each farmer will have these practices, their own practices and their own strategy in terms of reorganization. And uh, to be attractive for farmers, um, it will be interested to have preferred access to credit line and facilities. Uh, what I want to highlight also is that um, there are other tools in uh, Brazil um, to um, foster restoration, and this um, proposition uh, is a combination with those other tools. Uh, finally, but not least, uh, we have to monitor. Uh, so first, uh, monitoring of uh, land use uh, dynamics so that the land use change uh, respect this municipal uh, microzoning, but also several ecological uh, indicators, such as carbon stock, soil erosion, connectivity, or hydrological uh, indicators. So to do that, uh, using previous method and uh, create also map um, at the municipal level to uh, look at the change over time. Uh, so to conclude, um, I would like to highlight the fact that these win-win strategies 
uh, can improve both the economic uh, aspects, the economic uh, performances, but also uh, improve the provision of ecosystem services. Today, a lot of uh, forests in this area are very degraded. Um, and um, we do also think that it can achieve better results than the actual command and control policy or than the Brazilian forest code that only um, restrict to zero deforestation goal, uh, but don't take into account forest degradation or connectivity. Um, furthermore, um, the, the, those rules can be viewed as a constraint by the farmer, and we do think that uh, this landscape restoration plan can be more attractive, both for farmer, municipal actor, but also private sectors. Uh, but it requires uh, strong monitoring capacities and good governance mechanism um, uh, to be applied. Thank you very much. Yeah, um, that's a good point. Um, actually, um, where the area of forests are already, uh, we uh, recommend to keep them protected so we don't touch them. Uh, this is more where they are already very degraded and they are very fire prone. So um, it's very difficult to um, start a process of rege regeneration. Um, I'm not an ecologist, but I agree that uh, probably the type of species um, are very different between those riparian area and the, um, like the rainforest on the plateau. Um, and that's why we work with um, ecologists, uh, forest ecologists in our team. And uh, um, they will uh, develop those connectivities indicators and biodiversity indicators. So um, I hope they will also take into account that part. Mm. Um, so, um, so the municipal, uh, we will, um, I mean, I won't, but, uh, it will have this municipal microzoning and then it will be a voluntary commitment. So the farmer uh, will not, uh, it won't be mandatory to respect this uh, plan. Uh, but that's why it's very important to uh, develop um, specific credit lines or uh, subsidies to encourage the farmers to be involved in this plan. Um, but uh, regarding the ownership in Brazil and Amazon, it's uh, very complex. Uh, a lot of farmers do not have um, title of the land. Um, so it can be also a limitation for them to access uh, credit at the bank. Um, so if we succeed in um, working with NGO or um, other type of bank that can support those farmers that develop this uh, restoration strategy, it will be also attractive for them. Um, so we have to go at this level of, um, so in um, Brazil they have what we call the car, so we have the boundary of the property, um, so we could look uh, which agri farmer could lose or win uh, area, um, but um, farms 
size varies. Um, so we have uh, two types, the small, order, small holder that are below 250 hectares and then all the fazenda that are uh, uh, very, very bigger. I mean, it can be from 500 hectares to 10,000. Um, so it's true that uh, large fazenda have more, um, like they have more land, so it's maybe easier for them to apply uh, this uh, restoration plan that's um, like a small holder that will only have slope area. Um, in Paragominas, um, I don't think that the small holder only have slope area, but uh, yes, for sure, we, we have to be careful about that as well. Good point. Coming next, uh, we have um, we are Rakitan Browning Rajal uh, prioritizing the environmental recovery of the Rio Dolce watershed at Rakhil Thank you very much. Oh, I guess that's too modern. <laughs> Thank you. The pointer? Okay. So good afternoon, everybody. It's really a pleasure to be here. Um, so I'm, I'm going to present today um, the results of uh, a collaboration we have had with the uh, Renova Foundation, uh, which had the ambitious aim to restore 40,000 hectares of forest uh, in the, in the uh, um, Dossi Basin following the disaster, the Tilly Dam disaster, and how we approach this complex environmental but also socioeconomic problem. Um, so, just very quickly, uh, as probably many of you have heard, uh, Brazil has probably one of the worst environmental disasters uh, in history uh, in 2015, where a huge uh, uh, tillage uh, uh, dam uh, with basically, basically waste from uh, mining, I, my, our mining, has exploded basically, and then we had uh, this tide of, uh, of uh, toxic waste, in, in a few cases people have said that, uh, that has actually reached the ocean, 500 kilometers away uh, from where it has happened. And, um, and as part of the, uh, of the broader agreement that has been signed between the companies and, uh, uh, and, the, and, the, and basically the, uh, the, um, the government, they have agreed to pay something like uh, 4 billion US dollars in different investments throughout. Some of those investments are di uh, directed to the local population and some of those is to uh, recover the areas directly affected by the, uh, the, the tillage waste, uh, but also there has been uh, uh, mostly in the case of 1.1 1. 1 billion point uh, two he uh, reais, which is about $300,000 million, dollars, which has been dedicated to compensation in areas that has not been affected directly, but could improve the livelihood of the population in the region. And that has been the ch our challenge. So you have here uh, the problem of recovering uh, the areas marked in red, uh, which are the areas uh, that has been basically the forest, deforested in the last uh, 200 years, uh, which actually cover most of the region. Um, and we have like a subcut on the off of the region, like uh, which basically show the areas which are the water catchment that probably could provide water for the populations that right now are dragging and taking the water from the main river. But since the water quality of the main river has decreased because of the tillage dam, they have to look at someone else. But even the, the alternative uh, water catchment areas are not as good because of the degradation, the forest degradation during all this period. Um, and so you have the problem of uh, making a restoration of, of 40,000 uh, hectares, which is a lot, but at the same time is, is 1% of the degraded area. So it's a drop on the ocean, so it has to be well spent. At the same time, it's one of the poorest regions uh, uh, of, Brazil, of the southern part, southern eastern part of Brazil. Uh, the 300 million US dollars is a substantial investment, so we also have to think, okay, how this can also be not only something related to environmental recovery, but also an opportunity, a social opportunity, uh, uh, a social recovery opportunity for the local communities. And at the same time, the local community, uh, which has had a very conflictive relation with the mining companies and with Hanover themselves, they have demanded to understand what's going on and understand the rationale and contribute to that. And so we have come up with this idea uh, of, of what you are calling here the, the fractal geometry, 
uh, concept. So to first create a broader uh, framework which divides the problem in its social, environmental, and vocational part, as I'm going to explain, but also to have an approach uh, that, uh, whereby the priority applies the same principle at the top level when you look at the whole watersheds, but also at the property level when you look at exactly where uh, the, the, the areas are going to be restored. And, and so, as you know, the fractal is the mathematical principle where uh, by looking at a, a portion of the problem, you have the same, the, same time of, the same type of characteristics you have in the broader as well. Because what we have noticed in many restoration projects, you have a very nice watershed level prioritization, but then when it goes to the watershed, basically the people that are closer or maybe are friends of the mayor or maybe want, do not, uh, probably not, do not have an interest in, in agricultural development of the areas, seek up the investment, and other areas which are much more important from an environmental perspective are left out. Uh, so we wanted really to gap that local, uh, regional uh, gap. And so this is the broader uh, uh, approach, which actually, it's very simple, uh, and uh, um, which is a, a hierarchical multi-criteria where we have judged and considered the different data inputs for, to build an index for environmental vulnerability, for social vulnerability, and for vocational vulnerability, which by its turn is weighted according to the type of intervention, so what, what type of forest recovery that area is going to receive, and then which generates a multi-scale priority map which is then specialized according to the criteria I'm going to explain. So, uh, in relation to those, those three dimensions, the first one, conceptually, uh, the environmental vulnerability, which of course uh, is, is the driving uh, aspect of many of the projects related to prioritization of recovery areas, is to understand, uh, to the select the areas that by uh, recovering, which not necessarily restoring to its original uh, aspect, but to, but to recover it to a level where it can provide the ecosystem service that we need. In this case, uh, the water-related ecosystem services. Um, but also we have the problem of social vulnerability. So uh, to what extent you can help people uh, by uh, providing opportunities for income, um, and also the case of vocational. So where this intervention is actually going to work, where there is a social fabric to take that on. I'm going to really rush now, sorry about that. Uh, so for environmental vulnerability, it, we took into considerations from the water availability to erosion, wildfires, uh, and, but most specifically also how specific property level uh, that based on modeling of 100,000 individual properties uh, by considering, for instance, what are it, uh, what is if there is forest or not in terms of the repairing areas, the hilltops, and have calculated that for every single property. That allows us to have an idea of, from a legal perspective, which also has environmental impacts, which are the areas which are uh, up to their obligations or not, which are out of that have their repairing areas degraded, but also legal reserve in other aspects. And that has led us to uh, the vulnerability uh, index calculated at a 30 uh, meters pixel level. Also, social vulnerability that looks into, looks into consideration at the, uh, the level of employability, uh, whether there is uh, actually a high percentage of black people in a certain area that we know have, have serious problems in Brazil in terms of finding jobs in relation to, to other people, um, and also calculated, uh, basically also inspired in the case of Katrina, that's a methodology developed back then for, for Louisiana. And we have here also that, that layer. And finally, have the recovery index, which considers uh, the three types of, uh, um, of restoration modalities, which one is the passive one, which are supposed to have the most of the area. But then you have 10,000 hectares, which you can have both active restoration from non-economic purpose, and we work really, really hard to put also within the frame agroforestry, which was actually a bit of a fight with the environmental agency. They did not want it, but we thought it was very, very important because it provides income also for the poorer populations. And, uh, and especially in relation to the passive restoration, one of the key problems is you might select an area, but is it, is it viable to actually just uh, fence it off and expect that in 30 years you're going to have a decent forest there? Uh, so we have developed this model, uh, and which actually was published uh, uh, by us in 2017, where we consider the landca landscape context, so the distance from native vegetation, but also the land use history. So to what extent you have had a long, for a longer period uh, uh, other land uses so that the seedlings might not uh, uh, be there anymore, you know, just to expand, but also the, the climatic aspect of that, and, up, and also at local level, working at a, at a 30 meter pixel, to what extent, you, what is the topography? So as we know, uh, uh, forests are very good going, going downhill, but not as good as going uphill, and of course this has a, a broader implication in terms of, of recovery. 
And this allowed us to have this. Uh, so you can see here broadly how there is macro regions which are have better and, uh, and which are in red and lower favorability for, ac for, for passive regeneration. But even in the ones that are very bad, if you zoom in, you're going to find some small islands where you can actually approach and, and implement this kind of, of, of alternative. So it's not actually, it's quite heterogeneous it's when you move in and you zoom in at, prop at proper level. And, and then coming come up to the combination of the different layers, there has been a, a, a very intense debate uh, with both uh, the Hanova amongst the researchers, but also with, with the local population on what is actually more important, which of those dimensions is more important in terms of the different uh, 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 types of restoration. So in terms of passive restoration, our agreement was that uh, the social vulnerability is not as important because it's, it's very actually cheap to do this on the ground. You're not make, making people rich in transforming the economy of a, of, a, of a county by building fences, basically. So that's not we emphasize this too much, and let's find a balance between the environmental vulnerability, which is the final aim of the objective, but also the vocation, because if there is no uh, favorability for, pa active for passive restoration, that area, forget about it. So there is, and, and there is a, a dilemma, because the areas that are more environmentally degraded are usually less prone for passive restoration. So we walked in, the, uh, uh, in a very fine line there. Um, but also in relation to active restoration, in that case, you can, uh, uh, kind of, you know, let let aside the vocation for restoration because it's not as important. Um, but but then environmental, then that's the opportunity to really take the investments to areas which are very highly degraded. Uh, and at the same time, you can put a, a bigger weight on social vulnerability because you create uh, a supply chain for seedlings and, and more jobs and, and more opportunities in that sense. And finally, for agroforestry, we, we really believe there is, must be a balance between those three elements. And this, this, that's basically the final results. Uh, so for instance, here you see uh, for uh, agroforestry, interestingly, it has mapped as the red, which is more important, the areas which currently now has some experience with agroforestry, which is more farmers, uh, which might actually take that up, but at the same time has sufficiently high uh, environmental degradation, so it's worth it and, and interesting to actually implement that. Uh, while for uh, uh, the, um, the, the, the the natural uh, uh, regeneration, uh, it even found within highly degraded areas, some smaller areas, some smaller municipalities that we are, where we are able to bring that up. And so, one step, okay, you have the different layers, you have the priority, so where exactly you should, that, that kind of intervention should be taken? So, uh, we adopt a modeling, especially modeling approach, developed, all of this developed uh, in a Dynamica EGO, which is software, a, a, a free software developed by, by our team, led, led by Professor Gritaldo Soares Filho, which is here, uh, which basically looks at a different priority map as a probability map for sending seeds, and as soon as, it's, it, as it drops, it tries to expand. And, um, and in this way, uh, you are able actually to have uh, broader patches uh, which cover specific regions in, uh, and, uh, and allow the Hanover Foundation, while implementing, to go actively to farms, knock on the door and say, we'd like to do it here. Of course, we, we have uh, uh, given a higher budget and so more areas than actually going to be reforced because you know some farmers simply want to, didn't want, wouldn't want to do it, but at least there is this, uh, this active approach of the ones doing the restoration rather than the passive call out in the local community who wants to do it, and of course you have some problems uh, of uh, a selective bias in relation to that. So uh, to conclude very quickly, sorry, I'm out of time, uh, important to develop a mood-scale approach for prioritizing that and, and, and how it must really work and try to connect at different levels, from the watershed level to the landscape property level. That's it. Thank you very much. <laughs> it's really up. Or? Well, uh, some of the uh, actions are really especially related to the, uh, the restoration of the, talking about specifically the forest part, uh, the, the restoration of some of the, the water spring have, have been advanced. This one has not actually hit the ground because 
it's what it was it was so, it was so complicated working with them because basically there was those huge fights between the foundation and the environmental agencies and then the uh, the, the, the the public uh, the you know the procurers would end on and it would block it out so we we expected to have actually finished it all and have it on the ground since uh, last year but there was this one year extra year of just extra moving back and forth but now the whole project has been approved and with a good stamp i think about three three weeks four weeks ago and so we expect that if in this year we're going to to start with the first probably a thousand uh, uh, hectares and then it's going to to scale up from, from there Yeah, you, well, it's it's uh, open too, so we can do it whatever you want. So, uh, uh, in, since since it is, 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 it is especially explicit, uh, um, what you can what you can do is basically to think, okay, I'm I'm this pixel, and uh, and what are the probability of the path of active restoration? Sorry, so passive restoration in cons in relation to the distance of the next fragment, in relation to, to 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 the topography, in relation to the land use. So it calculates at pixel level. And then uh, uh, that's one that's one step. Then the next step is that okay, I have some adding up the different layers, which which are become probabilities. Should I reforest this part? And then it's going to, de to depend on whether a seedling, so based on the, on the probability, is going to arrive there, and whether by expanding it out, I, I can create a. a uh, patch which is wide enough, big, big enough to make a difference because we don't want to have one hectare here and one hectare there. So we test out uh, millions of different combinations and then filter them, filter those which are more viable for, you know, in order to provide those ecosystem services. Sorry. Yeah, actually, they, they do have a lot of money. It's 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 incredible. I think that the average it's about uh, eight thousand dollars per hectare investments. Uh, yeah, as the, as the possible investments per hectare because they, their budget is much bigger than the area they want to cover, and that's one of the reasons we are basically saying, come on, guys, let's make it as a you know a transformative thing for, for, for the area. And, and and from the beginning, we wanted to also to have the social aspect. That's why we really uh, try to find, because in the original legal agreement, it wasn't saying agroforest at all. It was saying uh, passive and active reforestation, thinking on the active just to you know build again an Eden from the, the year uh, uh, 1500s in Brazil. But then we said, okay, but you can have uh, active restoration with, with or without economic use. And so it was a way to a twist on in terms and within the economic use, that's agroforestry basically. Uh, but we don't know yet within those 10,000 hectares how much is going to be agroforestry. We hope it all will be. But I think, I think that's another legal battle they're going to have with the environmental agency. So we are basically he giving here the, the tools and the viability and to show where it should be. And then of course, them, the other ones that have to find. Okay. Yeah, we can we can even ask you Berajara to open up this the model of favorability. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you. Oh, how can I take it out? You probably um I think. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, so coming next, uh Daniela Schweitzer. Uh, perceived barriers for scaling up and monitoring forest restoration, Brazil as case study. All right. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. um, yes, so this is one of these flash talks I've never done before. Uh, but it's continuing on this topic of Brazil and forest uh, restoration and also on um, this um, topic that is a core of this um, um, meeting, I think, which is how to connect global narratives with local realities and what people want to do um, in terms of land use in their properties. Uh, so this we already heard about, the Bond Challenge as a big opportunity that is driving a lot of these global narratives of win-win, um, forest restoration as a win-win approach 
for meeting uh, various SDGs. And so the question is, okay, so how do these narratives um, trickle down into the local um, scale? And this is in the case of Brazil that has this legal mandate for the restoration of areas in private rural properties. And in addition, in the Atlantic forest biome, only around 7% of the forest cover remains. So this drives a lot of restoration uh, momentum and a lot of people interested in, in this topic um, in, the, in, in the national sphere. And we hypothesize that these narratives were gonna differ as one move uh, down to the local scale. And for the local scale, we chose four landscapes, two of them uh, mountainous, small scale farmers of um, coffee and cattle and fruits, and two that are medium to large scale farmer, not as large as in Paragominas, uh, but of coffee and sugar cane, the states of Espiritu Santo and Sao Paulo, where this took place. And this was based on um, semi-structured interviews. And the, the findings, well, we find across all um, actors and scales, this financial narrative in terms of restoration being a costly activity, yet we find at the global and national scale this rhetoric about productive restoration as an approach to um, a scale up um, implementation of restoration. Uh, but in the local um, spheres, they still just see it that they need funding because they don't see this as an income generated activity, it's just legally mandated for uh, water conservation. So they very much see just the riparian areas as a potential for restoration. And then there's this narrative on capacity weaknesses, the need for capacity improvements, and this uh, narrative on governance and the importance of, of multi-stakeholder arrangement that only um, was found at the global and national scales, but it doesn't come down to the state and the local scales that see it just as a very top-down mandate. And then this issue of um, small property size all across the, the board of the different rural properties that, that we interviewed, they all said, we don't have any more land, land for restoration. We can't give any more of our productive land for forest restorations. So they just see it as a um, not um, non-productive land use. And thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> This is, I don't like these flash talks. <laughs> Well, first of all, for them, um, agroforestry is not forest restoration. Um, for the local um, landowners, they do, some of them do some kind of agroforestry, put some trees in, in their coffee as shade, or they, they do some fruit planting. But for them, that's not forest restoration. For them, forest restoration is just really either natural regeneration or just planting uh, some native species in what the forest code indicates or the now called the native vegetation law, which is native species for environmental protection. This is very much the restoration of the riparian areas that has been since the 1960s uh, mandated. And uh, so this is more of what is in the local mindsets still. Yeah. But this, the, the, the NGOs at the national, and some of them at the state scale, they are trying to uh, make them do some of these, of these productive restorative activity like agroforestry to uh, restore these legal reserve areas, which are the ones that by law could also be used for some production. And, uh, but this is very new in their mindsets, yeah, still, so. Mm -hmm. um, we don't have that strength, um, that strong institutional action. So what would be other concerns 
So you mean like if they would have to restore without having the legal mandate to, to do so? Uh, I think it's very much around financial uh, issues because the capacity, like um, some of them that don't really know maybe what to plant, they fence the area and they let it regenerate uh, or or they um, they plant some, some trees. There's a a lot of knowledge in Brazil in terms of the, or in the Atlantic forest at least, in terms of the native species that can be, you can find them in nurseries. And so the, this capacity is, is okay, I think. But so it's, it boils down more to, to this issue of uh, financial. <laughs> Yes, <laughs> so this is what happens in uh, dynamic uh, land use uh, yeah. system science. So yes, so this this happened last this this uh, research took place last year, and and now I interviewed again some some people to ask. Well, now this paper is coming out. Like how how valid this this is, and um, because they were very uh, optimistic about the new um, tools like the registry system, the car. And that now, like somebody said in the previous session, things are very up, much up in the air. Like they don't know very much what is going to be dismantled in this uh, forest native vegetation law, or or what they most of them think is that there's just not going to be much political will to inf enforce it. Um, so this is kind of sad. Yeah. But, um, but yes, as somebody also said, I think in previous session is that. The, the NGOs and the academia, like people who are uh, the proponents of um, scaling up restoration are trying to go more locally and try to, in this sense, <coughs> overcome the barriers on, at the federal level and, and try to keep this momentum going. So there's, there's the Pacto for the Atlantic Forest that is very well known. So these people are still very active and trying to continue this, this work. So. Yes, yeah, so this this um, this is this is uh, an issue because there have there have not really been any federal, not even before, any federal um, how to say funding lines that could reach the the ground. At in some states, like Espiritu Santo, had the um, a program in which the oil revenue from the state is is implemented in um, in Reflorestar, which is a program for the the more sustainable uh, land uses in, in farms, the implementation of this. Uh, but but some in some states, this is lacking, and, and this is always a, some, an issue. And some pockets of money are coming, but like from through the World Bank, which has to go through the federal government. Uh, so this, I wonder how they are going to play out in this current government. But yes, it's, it's very... People are not very hopeful that much is going to happen in this in this presidency. So, <laughs> yes. From biome, biome to biome, yeah. Right, yeah. Yes, the the thing is that this this proportion varies also not only biome to biome, but also uh, depending on how how big your farm is. So some farms, uh, they don't have to restore this legal reserve. They just, if they have a riparian area that they have to restore, uh, no matter how small they are, but this legal reserve part, which is this part in which they can do some productive uh, restoration, this some farms don't have. So, um, so in that sense, if you are a larger farmer that you have to restore maybe a larger portion of your farm, but you 
have more the more means because you are larger. Uh, so this this uh, this financial barrier in the larger states, I I imagine is is less of a, of an issue. The problem is that these larger uh, farms uh, are also the ones that tend to not comply very much with the law because they have some kind of power <coughs> in the in the government and they just uh, so this was something that came up a lot in the interviews that the, that most of the passive the environmental passive is in larger properties who have the financial means but they are not willing to because they tend to be in the in productive areas so for example like large sugarcane producers or uh, large cattle ranchers they don't want to take land out of production the way they s they see it and and you cannot tell a cattle rancher well you have you can put this legal reserve and you can now do agroforestry because he's a cattle rancher so he's not interested in in any agroforestry so this is also another another challenge of trying to bring down this concept of productive restoration in legal reserves which would be a way to avoid any kind of financial barriers they perceive they can have um, but for the for the small farmers it in, in across different parts of, Bra of Brazil, you have some schemes of payment for ecosystem services uh, that they, that helps them a bit. So yes, but Brazil is so huge that is so many countries in one. <laughs> the, the realities change a lot uh, in different places. Yeah.